Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rez Mani, and I'm application scientist for a company Allied Scientific Pro. And the title of today's webinar is Laser Cleaning Method and Case Studies. I've given this webinar a number of times, and every time I try to include the new activities of the company, the, the new case studies or progress that we have made with the laser cleaning, uh, so that it reflects the activities of the company. Uh, my email is also mentioned here. You can email me after if you have any questions. The conference is also, the webinar is also being recorded. A recording will be sent to you. Also, I want to say that um, the GoTo meeting platform is not really meant for showing videos, but I'll show some videos anyway. Uh, if there is any issues with the quality, we'll send you the videos after. You can watch them after. So let's look at the outline, uh, what we will be covering during this webinar. First of all, we talk about laser ablation, which is a more general case. And we look at different types of lasers that are used in laser ablation. Then we would focus on the particular subset of laser cleaning, which is only one of the uh, uh, part of the laser ablation. So laser ablation could be scribing, cutting, drilling, etc. And uh, laser cleaning is one of those applications. Then we would compare with other competing surface cleaning methods, such as sandblasting, uh, we discuss the advantages of laser cleaning and some accessories that we have designed to mitigate disadvantages of uh, laser cleaning, such as cobalt rust. Dependence of laser ablation on material properties and laser parameters, so a little bit of physics of laser ablation. Then we compare different time regimes, femtosecond, picosecond, nanosecond, and then uh, we would look at general applications of laser cleaning. So whenever I, men me I mention general application, I mean uh, this application exists, but we haven't done it. I'm just uh, giving you as uh, some kind of information. So for example, if you have never been to a nuclear power plant to clean, but it is possible to use our lasers there. And then we also have the case studies where we have actually done the the work. So we'll show you some videos and, and more information about that. So that's the difference between general application and case studies. And I'll introduce you to different uh, systems that we have, 100 watt, 200 watt, 300 watt, 500 watt uh, systems. We go through the different case studies. And then we have two more general applications, laser cleaning in food industry and laser cleaning of bacteria infected surfaces. So let's look at the principle of laser ablation. So the idea is that uh, you will focus a laser beam on the surface. And once you do that, there are several things that happen. There will be a high temperature gradient, high mechanical stress, and a plasma is formed, which also forms a shock wave. And this shock wave will cause a mechanical breakdown of the surface. So most of the laser cleaning processes uh, happens like this. There's There are also other mechanisms which I'll, which I'll discuss a little bit later. So both continuous wave and pulse lasers can be used for laser ablation, but in this talk we focus mostly on pulse lasers because you have more control over the parameters such as pulse duration and repetition rate and uh, the power pulse energy. And I'll demonstrate that uh, discuss that in more detail when we go into the case study, how these parameters matter. So here uh, is a demonstration. Again, this is from a Malaysian paper that talks about uh, car paint removal using, uh, using laser cleaning. So this is a reference in here. And it shows here that there is this layer of paint which was mostly for car automotive industry star, is made of resins, pigments, solvents, and additives. And uh, this is all deposited on the metal substrate. So once the laser beam hits this, the coating itself absorbs it. And then uh, there is a plasma formation shock wave, and it just cracks the network. And this 
basically ejects all these particles outwards. So here also you see another demonstration of the shock wave and uh, the substrate below the layer is preserved because by keeping the laser energy density below the damage threshold, you can avoid damaging the substrate. Now, I should also mention that some of the other coatings uh, are transparent to, to the near IR laser beam. And I will show that when I would discuss, uh, you know, other, other applications for nuclear industry. So in that case, the beam is absorbed by the metal underneath and then the, the shock wave is formed and then that shock wave will uh, basically destroy the coating layer. And this process where the actual substrate is absorbing instead of the coating is called spallation. And that's very much useful in nuclear industry, which we'll discuss later. Here is another way for laser ablation. This is just by thermal decomposition. So at lower energies, there is no shock wave. It's only evaporation of the coating. So that's also another possibility for uh, laser removal, which causes flames and smoke. Now let's look at some of the uh, lasers that are used for laser ablation uh, and cleaning. Uh, so we have gas lasers and we have solid state lasers. So two of these are gas lasers, starting with excimer laser, which is a UV laser. And it's a low rep rate uh, nanosecond pulse laser. It's mostly used in the labs. It's not really rugged enough to be deployed in the field. And it's used for uh, germicidal applications. Then we have the CO2 laser in mid IR at 10 micron. Uh, and this is another gas laser. Uh, it's so pumping method this is a gas discharge. It's very popular in the industry for cutting, cutting applications. It's also good for um, laser cleaning. There are some pros and cons that I'll discuss later. Then you have the Nudumium YAG laser. It's another near IR laser. It's a crystal laser. And uh, that is uh, at 1064 nanometers. Uh, so it's pumped by laser diodes. You can also generate second harmonic and uh, uh, higher harmonics using a harmonic crystal in front of it. And then finally, you have the Thai Sapphire laser, which is a tunable near IR laser. Uh, it's a femtosecond pulses, and uh, it can be used for laser machining. It's a low power. It's also used for laser cleaning in some applications. Uh, but the downside is it has to be pumped by a argon laser, which is quite expensive. Uh, so also it is low power. However, the most uh, popular laser that is used for laser cleaning these days is the fiber laser, which is also part of our system. So usually laser systems have, have a cavity and has mirrors. So one mirror is fully reflective, the other mirror is partially reflective. So in case of fiber lasers, instead of mirrors, they're using scribings. So inside the fiber core, there are scribings that you can see here in this image. And this acts like a reflection grading and reflects a particular wavelength. So this wavelength uh, is back and forth, is reflected back and forth and then gets amplified. Once you pump the fiber with a diode laser, then this uh, radiation is generated and it goes back and forth and gets amplified and exits the fiber end. So normally the, the, the pumping medium consists of doping materials such as ytterbium, erbium, or tulium. And um, the, this laser has advantage of flexibility that other lasers don't have because you can bend it to, to clean any areas that you, you desire. And it also has other advantages, such as high pulse energy, high average power, good beam quality, and variable pulse length. OK, so we talked about laser cleaning. And we said laser cleaning is, is a subset of laser ablation to remove unwanted layers or contamination from a solid substrate by formation of a shock wave and uh, blasting the contaminants. Uh, 
so in order to get more familiar with it, we are going to show this video. This is actually our 100 watt system. So the box contains uh, the pumping mechanism. Then you have this fiber optic cable. There is this isolator. And this is the laser head, which contains the galvos and also the, the lens where you have to focus the beam. So this is the laser head part. So let's look at uh, one video to get a better idea of our laser cleaning system, cleaning rust from a pipe. So you can see that there's a there is a pump there. It takes away all the debris. I'm not seeing any video. I don't know if anyone else is. Sorry, you're not seeing your no. video? I I am seeing the video. This is less uh... I don't know why. Anyway, uh, Rez, you can you can do it full screen when you play the video. Okay, let me try full screen. I'm seeing the video. Yeah. I need to click the link. That's can you hear the sound? Can you hear the sound also or no? Sorry, say again. What do you want me to do? I, and this is just Joe, and, and it just could be on my end, but I can hear sound. I just can't see anything. I just have the same slide up that says, what is laser cleaning? That's that's all I'm seeing. Well, I'm sharing my screen. I don't know why. Let me just check why uh, you can't see that. So if I play the video, all right so here. Yes, you can share the link on the messages with with everyone yeah. and they can watch at the same time on their own computers right but i can see it on the screen myself so what i've shared i can see this so i don't understand maybe you're you're not like you you have to minimize something or maximize something that's why you're not saying but anyway yeah i'll share you i'll share with you the, the link so you can see it thank you Is sorry it? to disrupt your your no flight worries, and your no worries no worries at all so here is the link and there you go so let's watch it together again so i assume you hear the sound and you can see there is a there is a pipe here, it's a vacuum pump that removes all the debris as it's being blasted. So someone was asking us on a, on a LinkedIn uh, post that we had, so what will happen to this debris? Do they magically disappear? I would say, no, there's no magic. There is, a, there, is a, there is a vacuum pump that removes all the debris, the solid dry debris, and then it will all go towards a HIPAA filter and gets absorbed by that. Okay, that's fine. All right, so that was the this one, and let's move on. So applications for laser cleaning technology, there are many areas and many industries that use laser cleaning. Uh, for example, conservation and restoration. So here are the pictures showing uh, cleaning of the parliament building in Ottawa. You can see the laser beam right here. There's a white line here. And this is an, uh, an artifact that, that is being cleaned uh so we have also cleaned bridge bridges in quebec and concrete repair 
So these are all possible. We also have done cleaning process in different industry, airspace, automobile, manufacturing process, ships, body parts. We had done some case studies. I'll show you about that later. So here you can see, for example, uh, a part of an engine of an aircraft is being cleaned of oil and soot and lead. So I'll show you a video of that later. And in the industrial section, uh, we have been to, for example, a caterpillar plant and uh, here, uh, you know, mounted our laser and their uh, process line and, you know, the conveyor belt or process line and then it cleaned their, their parts. So many different industries are using this. And what are the important parameters for laser cleanings that we have to consider? First of all is the, is the wavelength, because some wavelengths are heavily absorbed by some material and the same wavelengths are not heavily absorbed. So for example, for metals, uh, near IR lasers are absorbed much better than mid IR. Mid IR is mostly reflected. But for paint, the near IR is basically uh, uh, um, not absorbed that well by near IR, but mid IR absorbs it very well. So if you want to clean uh, paint on a metal surface, and if you use a mid IR laser, it's inherently safe because it will uh, remove the paint because it has high absorption and the substrate doesn't get damaged because it reflects it mostly. Uh, but near IR also could be adjusted if you adjust the parameters you can avoid substrate damage the the advantage of um, near ir over mid ir is use of fiber optics so fiber optics would give flexibility and this is something that mid ir laser such as co2 doesn't have uh, pulse duration is important because the depth of ablation depends on pulse duration the longer the pulse duration the, the more is the penetration depth, so and the higher would be the energy per unit area to ablate the material. So you need to be careful if you're using longer pulses uh, not to damage the substrate. Pulse energy, obviously, increasing pulse energy would increase the rate of ablation. Beam shape uh, depends on what you're cleaning. If you're using, if you're cleaning a historical artifact that has lots of nooks and crannies, then you want to use a small beam. Or if a concrete block with pores are used, you need want to use a small beam. If you're using a, a wall or a ship's body which has no features, you can use a longer, uh, longer beam, like 20 centimeter long beam, to clean faster. So it depends. And repetition rate of the pulse laser <clears throat> comes into picture uh, basically if you increase the repetition rate you'll have more heat accumulations and that will reduce the threshold fluence because you know you can go deeper with the same pulse energy if you have more repetition rate a higher repetition rate you can you can create a, a basically you could reduce the threshold fluence or you can cut more deeply so this will affect that so let, let me rephrase that i don't think i said it correctly so if you keep the pulse energy the same and if you increase the repetition rate then you will increase If you want to reduce the energy per pulse, you can instead increase the repetition rate, and then you will achieve the same effect. Okay, so next there are some other parameters. Scan speed, this is from another paper. Uh, so if you increase the scan speed because the dwell time decreases on the surface, uh, you can say that the depth of removal decreases. So you will cut in less. Uh, number of passes, obviously, with more number of passes, you remove more. And another factor is substrate temperature. So here is a paper by Shamsu Joa, uh, who's talking about uh, removal of epoxy paint from stainless steel surfaces. And the, the y-axis is in Kelvin. So once you are below uh, the melting 
uh, whilst you keep the energy up to 2.3 joules per centimeter square, which is the fluence, not the energy, the fluence, the uh, substrate temperature, it remains around 1700 Kelvin, which is about 1500 something centigrade, and that's below the melting point of stainless steel. But above that, say around three joules per centimeter square, there's a sharp rise in temperature, and you can see temperature rise very rapidly, way above the melting point of uh, stainless steel, and uh, and that's not good. So you can see the substrate melts. So one has to be very careful about controlling the fluence not to damage the substrate. Okay, so let's uh, uh, look at some of the other competing methods of cleaning surfaces. Uh, so obviously the most popular one is the sandblasting or dry ice. These are very, very popular methods. Uh, you also have mechanical abrasives, uh, chemicals, where you apply a chemical and wait for a few minutes and then scratch it. And then all these other methods where a secondary medium comes out of a, a nozzle at high pressure, such as sandblasting, water jetting, and dry ice blasting. So well, the disadvantage of all these methods is that, first of all, you contaminate the environment because all the garbage uh, the, the, what you have cleaned would also need to be cleaned after. So you need to prepare the environment before and then you need to clean, clean up after. Uh, especially if you're in a radioactive environment, that's really important that you don't just let the mixture of sand and radioactive debris go into or your power, your, your water supplies, for example. So you need to do this cleaning. Then secondly, um, some of these methods could damage the substrate, like for example, mechanical abrasive could damage or scratch the substrate or even chemicals could spread to some other parts. And uh, they require heavy personal protection equipment because this debris will bounce back. Uh, and you know, the secondary medium will bounce back. And in fact, the operator should hold it very tight. There's a big reaction there. So it's not easy to, to operate it. So they need heavy personal protection equipment. It's, they're pretty noisy and um, process cannot be automated. So these are some of the disadvantages of these other competing methods. Uh, here's a table that I've added here that compares uh, laser cleaning with dry ice, sand, glass bead, walnut shells, water, steam solvents. And the pros and cons and everyone and you can see that in a lot of areas waste disposal toxic waste preparation intensive i'm not going to read this whole thing because once you receive the recording you can take a look at it in more detail and uh, this is a comprehensive comparison of laser cleaning with other other methods so this way you can uh, you can examine it but in many areas laser cleaning has advantages Uh, talking more about the advantages of laser cleaning, uh, we don't use a secondary medium because what hits the surface is only light and it has low environmental impact because the solid waste debris is immediately collected by a vacuum pump and is, is directed towards a HEPA filter. And then once the process is done, you can throw the HEPA filter out. Uh, you can dispose of it in whatever... Uh, you know, convenient and standard way it is. Selectivity is another important uh, factor, uh, which I will demo in this video. Uh, so basically certain parameters, for example, pulse width and energy fluence, wavelength, rep rate can be tuned to suit some material better than others. And uh, you'll understand this better when I just show this video. Uh, versatility, controlled removal, localized at action. These are all advantages of laser cleaning. So let me play this video, which has no voice, by the way. So, and I will share, I will share it so that you can also see, share the link. So, 
let's see. And so I shared the link already. And uh, here we would play this video. <laughs> So this video does not have a sound. So uh, what you can see is the laser beam is is shining over a Coke Zero can, which has black, white, and red colors. But the threshold energy of the beam has been tuned in such a way that it only removes the black and does not remove the red and white. So although it's shining on the red and white, it's not removing them. Uh, the absorption coefficient of black color is obviously more than white and uh, red, so you can tune the energy in such a way that it is good enough to remove the black paint, but not white and red. And this is something that you cannot do with any other method. If you use sandblasting, it will remove everything. So this selectivity is a very interesting feature of laser cleaning that we are demonstrating here. By the way, if you have any questions, you can type it in the chat. And once I get to the end of the, the webinar, I'll look at those questions, I'll answer them. So as we go along, if you have any questions, please feel free to type it in the chat. Okay, so that's this one. And we move to the next one. So actually going back here disadvantage of laser cleaning so basically no technique is perfect and uh, laser cleaning also has certain disadvantages so one disadvantage is need for focusing so you need to keep the the lens so if you go back to one of the one of the slides here yeah you can see in this one i was showing this lens so uh, in this case, uh, this lens has to be at the focal, focal length from the material that you want to clean or from the surface that you want to clean. So at that focal distance, you get maximum sound and there is maximum light that is coming out. So this is not the case with sandblasting. You can keep the nozzle at any distance. Uh, the other issue is a lower speed if you only compare the speed of cleaning uh, sandblasting is faster than laser cleaning but as i said you need to do preparation which will uh, take a lot of time so in order to deal with these disadvantages we have designed certain accessories so one accessory is a fume extractor nozzle that you can see over here so basically you would insert the laser head on one side on the left side there is an opening and then there are wheels on the other side so you could roll these wheels along the surface you want to clean and this distance is the same as the focal length so you don't have to worry about adjusting your hand to get that optimum position. And then you can also have a tube that removes all the debris. We also have robotics, robotics control. Uh, so I'll show you another video here for robotics control. Let me send you this link. I'll send you the link so you have it. Okay, and so here you can see a tube is being cleaned uh, and a robot is holding the laser head at the focal distance and is moving around. So this is very convenient because uh, the process could be really time consuming and boring. Uh, so if a robot could do the job, you don't want an operator to stand there and, you know, try to hold the laser at the, at the focus. So that's a big advantage. So for this reason also, we 
uh, we have the Cobot Ross program. So these are collaborative robot and Cobot Ross stands for Collaborative Robot Robotics as a Service. So we would rent out different cobots at different capacity, weight, for example. This one, the cobot Tom, could uh, take up to three kilograms and uh, it has uh, 40 hours. There is there is a reach also for it. Large size, yeah, here. Uh, medium size cobot reach 590 millimeters. And then Jane could be 800 millimeters and it could have up to five kilogram. And Rudy could be up to 1,000 millimeters and uh, payload 10 kilograms. So these uh, cobots could basically, you could rent them and they will do the job for you if you don't want an operator to hold the, to hold the laser head. So these are very useful. All right, so I'm going to move quickly a little bit on the dependence of laser ablation and material properties and laser parameters. Uh, so the parameters of importance are optical attenuation coefficient, alpha, thermal diffusivity, heat of vaporization, and the laser parameters is the wavelength, the pulse duration, the fluence, and beam size. So in order to understand this, let's look at this diagram. So I would explain what's going on here. So the beam of laser shown by this orange uh, rectangle is shining on this block and it penetrates, the optical beam is penetrating the block by uh, depth of L alpha. So this is the optical penetration depth, which is only one over the absorption coefficient. So as long as the pulses are below 10 picosecond, uh, then this will be no other thermal penetration into other areas. So the energy is confined within this uh, depth of L alpha. But if the pulses are greater than 10 picosecond, then the thermal, uh, then there will be thermal penetration into other areas showing by this yellow rectangle of depth L tau, which is also pulse dependent. So D tau, tau L is the pulse duration. So for picosecond, nanosecond pulses, thermal penetration depth is greater than optical penetration depth and grows with pulse duration. So the threshold fluence is defined as the minimum energy to per unit area to remove the material. And in case of very short pulses, 10 picosecond, they are uh, independent of the pulse duration. So they're given by this equation, which is density, heat of vaporization, and optical penetration depth. But for higher pulses, they depend on L tau, which is the thermal penetration depth, which is indeed dependent on the pulse duration. So higher pulse duration, there will be more depth of penetration and you need more energy, more fluence to, to remove the material. Now let's look at the different regimes, femtosecond, picosecond, and nanosecond regimes. Again, we are looking at the more general case of laser ablation, where we see that in case of uh, short pulses, there are no thermal effects. As you can see in this diagram, no micro cracks, no shock wave, no um, heat transfer to surrounding medium, no damage caused by adjacent structures. But in case of long pulses, you get all kinds of liquid physics effects kicking in. And you have damage caused by adjacent structure, ejected molten material, surface debris, and shock waves, and so on. So the thermal effects are more pronounced in case of longer pulses. Here is a picture comparison of three holes drilled by femtosecond, picosecond, and nanosecond laser. And you can see how neat this one is, the femtosecond. But as the pulse duration increases, the debris and the molten stuff increases around the hole. So this is not to say that we shouldn't use nanosecond laser. We are, all of our lasers are nanosecond lasers for cleaning. The idea of this is that 
the thermal effects are more pronounced as you increase the pulse duration. So let's say if you had a chance between a 10 nanosecond and 100 nanosecond uh, laser um, pulse duration, you should be aware that the 100 nanosecond will have more thermal effects. Then we have the long and short wavelength behavior. And the idea of this uh, slide is to show that uh, the metals, they have very small absorption coefficient at mid IR and at longer wavelengths, at, sorry, at mid near IR wavelengths, uh, the absorption coefficient increases. So you can see in this case that absorption coefficient increase for all these metals at near IR, but at mid IR is pretty low. However, glass, plastics, uh, paint, they are the reverse. So at mid IR, they have high absorption coefficient, and mid near IR, they are small. So that would bring the advantage of CO2 laser uh, that is, is effective for removing paint. But you can also achieve the same effect with near IR lasers if you adjust the parameters correctly to avoid uh, damaging the substrate. And then you can also use the advantage of fiber optics, which is really great uh, flexibility advantage for near IR lasers. So some general applications, not going too much into detail in these, but here is removal of paint from aircraft uh, body. So you need to clean the old paint because first of all, you can't, uh, you can't deposit the new paint on the old paint. It will add to the weight of the aircraft. And secondly, for better work done, it's always best to remove the old paint and put a fresh near layer of paint. And here you can see that the, the robots are hard at work and they're cleaning in the hangar different parts of the aircraft. And uh, another very interesting application is laser cleaning for nuclear decontamination. And uh, the idea is that after 30 to 40 years, nuclear power plants, uh, they need to be decommissioned because they develop cracks in their structure. So because the metals that are used inside, they are radioactive and the concrete is radioactive, you can't just throw them out. So laser cleaning comes very much in use in decommissioning uh, nuclear power plants. Uh, in Ontario, we generate 60% of our electricity uh, by using fission plants. So this is quite important. So there will be a layer of cobalt 60 deposit on feeder pipes, which has a half-life of seven years. So the corrosion of these metal pipes basically releases some products in the reactor coolant and this will go into the uh, radioactive part of the reactor and gets radioactive and comes back and deposit on these feeder pipes uh, and you need to remove these if you want to recycle the metal so laser cleaning could do that by this process of spallation which I explained at the at the very beginning where the beam uh, passes through the oxide and is get absorbed by the by the metal and then the shock wave will remove these these oxides. This is quite an important application. So let's quickly look at uh, some of our laser systems. Uh, this is our original laser system, 100 watt system that we introduced a few years ago. And we saw it in action in one of the videos removing rust. Then a few years ago, we did the 200 watt system, which has a narrower form factor. It has some cabinets here where you can um, store uh, basically laser goggles and lenses for the, uh, for the system. You can keep it here. And all of them have tunable rep rates and pulse duration. And then there was a need for a small laser, so we, we modified the, the 100 watt system, we call it 100 watt Gen 2. It's a compact and portable design, so one man could carry it like a suitcase, and 60% uh, smaller, 40% lighter, and uh, instead of having, let's go back to one of the slides here, so this is an iPad 
on the surface of this on the box so you can do all the uh, setup setting up and you know all the parameters you want to set using the iPad so this system has replaced the iPad with a user-friendly touch encoder so this way you don't need to have a big iPad on the system and the head is a smaller as well so this is very useful for tight places such as the bilge of a ship if you want to go through the hatches and you want to use it it's very useful there are some designs uh, some features of the laser head uh, you can also design the laser head so it acts like a torch uh, and this is our 300 watt system which we have sold two units to two different customers in Canada and uh, Finally, this is our 500 watt system, uh, which has a long fiber optic cable, 22 meter long, which could be coiled and kept underneath this lid, uh, very safe. It also has a chiller, so you need to actually ch uh, cool the laser head. And um, there are all these leak free, quick disconnects and key color coded. It has a long power cord as well. All right, so let's quickly go to uh, some of our case studies. The first case study is testing at the Permafix Nuclear Decontamination F Facility in Richland, Washington. And that was done back in 2017. So they deal with low and medium radioactive waste. So what we did was we took our 100 watt laser system there and they define an area there which was under negative pressure so the box was kept outside of that our engineer was also standing near the box adjusting parameters and the laser head was routed through this a negative pressure area technicians of richland washington facility they were uh, doing the laser cleaning and also radiation technician was measuring before and after Several items were cleaned, including concrete blocks and metal objects and so on. So let's look at this video and uh, get a better understanding of what happened there. So I'm going to send you the... Yes, send you the link. Okay, so I'm going to play the video. So here the metal is being cleaned, the metal plate, uh, the, the engineer technician is cleaning it with our laser cleaner under what system and uh, the radiation technician is measuring the disintegration for a minute and this pump is this tube goes to the vacuum pump through the HEPA filter so it collects all the debris you can see that the, the laser head is all wrapped in plastic bags uh, so that it doesn't uh, get contaminated here there's a c-clamp that is being cleaned it's radioactive so after two passes with laser it went down to less than thousand initially it was five thousand Here you can see the body of the C-clamp is being cleaned. There is a, there is a curvature there. Mm -hmm. 
And here is a torch hat is being cleaned. It was 15,000 before, and after two passes, it was 4,000. And finally, there's a concrete block, which was the most difficult one. That's why it has a small beam, uh, because there's kinds of poor, poor structure. So there has all kinds of poor structure, which makes it more difficult to clean. Okay. So that was our, our work in the uh, Richland, Washington facility. And another case study was done uh, last December. This is a relatively new radioactive robotic laser cleaning at McMaster University's particle accelerator radioactive decontamination facility. So the idea was that we took our 100 watt system with a cobot and they have a hot cell facility in McMaster University in Hamilton and uh, they generated using the particle accelerator the f18 uh, radioactive isotope which has a very short half-life so the half-life of this isotope is only 109 minutes and why did we choose this it was only for security reasons in case there was a mistake and you know there was spilling uh, so they wanted just to be able to wait for 24 hours and this would just disintegrate. All of it would disintegrate. So this fluorine 18 was uh, was solved in a methanol solution, and using a paintbrush was applied to several metal surfaces. This acts like a powder on the surface of the substrate and can be wiped using a wet wipe, so it does not get embedded in the body of the metal. So these five metals that we used aluminum, uh, then we have chrome vanadium, stainless steel, brass, and steel. And you can see the cobot was mounted and was inserted inside the hot cell. The plates were all inside the hot cell where there was suction and you know all the, all the vapors would be sucked by a vacuum pump and goes through a tall stack. And uh, we defined the uh, uh, a minimum radiation level of 5,000, uh, sorry, 500, 500 CPM to be assigned to a clean level. Most of these metals, they had 5,000 to 10,000 counts per minute uh, radiation level. So we did clean them, and here's a video that I want to show you. This was inside, the camera was inside the, uh, the hot cell. I'll send you the link first. And I will play this video. Sorry. Yes. So this is the beginning. You can see this is the laser head, which is being held by the cobot. And at the beginning, the technician would measure. This is actually the soft metal brass that we are using so they measure what the radiation level is and then after they measured it then at some point the laser cleaner will come on so at this point laser cleaner starts and it does the scans And then finally at the end, they measure again 
from the surface that has been cleaned. And if the radiation was below 500 CPM, then they would stop the operation. Otherwise, they would continue. So what did we learn from this? Uh, basically, uh, there were soft metals and there were hard metals. So aluminum and brass, they were soft metals. And these other ones, stainless steel, steel, chrome, vanadium, they were hard metals. So for hard metals, we used more aggressive settings, 350 nanosecond, for example, 120 kilohertz, and the scan speed of 5,000, for example, we used for all the hard metals. And for soft metals, uh, such as aluminum, we reduced the pulse width to 200 nanosecond because we didn't want to damage the surface. And uh, we also use a rep rate of uh, 120 kilohertz. So in this case, for example, for brass, uh, it's a soft metal. We had to make decisions on the spot. So if we were going back again, we would use a 200 nanosecond on brass. Because you can see for brass and aluminum, it took less number of passes to get to the 500 level. So you need less aggressive. So it would, be, would have been preferable to use a 200 nanosecond for brass. But at the moment, we use 350 nanosecond. For others, chrome vanadium, uh, we saw there are some scratches that are being developed. So for the last scan, we increased the rep rate from 120 kilohertz to 180. Remember, I said if you increase the rep rate, uh, basically, uh, yes, the, the rep rate increase would affect the, the threshold fluence. And uh, the scan speed was 6,000, and then... At the end, it was for the last scan, we used a 3000 millimeter because we wanted to go faster. So both of these changes, 180, increasing the rep rate and decreasing the uh, scan speed would help the faster laser cleaning because it was taking a long time to do it. And for chrome vanadium, we, we needed more aggressive setting. So that's why we increased the rep rate and uh, we would decrease the scan speed. So then we have the laser cleaning in ship industries. Uh, this was in, done in trials in Halifax and Shelburne ship repair. Uh, so they wanted to clean the area, and that's why this uh, ship was wrapped in a tarp. And uh, basically, it was, it was all prepared for sandblasting. So we took our systems, all of our 100 watt, 200 watt, 500 watt system. There was some onshore cleaning and some offshore cleaning. So this is onshore cleaning at Shelbourne Ship Repair. And the first thing that was cleaned was uh, the basically plenum of the ship where we used the 500 watt. And not only we cleaned paint, uh, we also formed a, a surface profile of 10, 4 mil on there. So that's another requirement. And that was another very popular question on our, our LinkedIn post that could we do a profile the answer is yes we did do a hundred micron or four mil profile on there uh, for the bilge we could only use the 100 watt system uh, because it had to be uh, lowered into the hatches and it was not possible to do it uh, with other systems and that's why the other gen 2 laser system is more suitable for this work so it could go through the hatches and cleans the cleans the bilge and we also did uh, onshore cleaning in Halifax shipyard with a 200 watt system different uh, metal pipes this is some more onshore cleaning using the 500 watt cleaning system in the Shelbourne ship repair and at the end basically we uh, come to the conclusion at that time, we didn't have the Gen 2, so we needed reduction of size of laser head. These are some of the suggestions that we received. Reduction of laser controller, extending the fiber optic cord. These were some of the suggestions that we received from the managers. 
So we are running out of time, so I'm going to have to hurry up on these. I'll send you all these videos. You can watch them. Uh, so this is cleaning of the leaded paint. So lead is obviously very dangerous for health. So aside from the HEPA filter, you also need to use a BOFA filter that has all these basically uh, scroll plates. So by centrifugal centripetal force the heavier particles will go uh, outside and they get collected by these scroll plates and fall into the plates heavier particle the enters the filter scroll plate through centripetal force and moving the outside where they get contact with the steel the scroll allowing the particulate to settle in the dropout chamber and then the rest of this would go through the current flow into the BOFA filter. The lighter particles would do that. So there are video, videos that we can show you. And these are some videos on removing soot and paste, uh, sorry, soot and, soot and oil from the aircraft parts. So let me show you quickly one of the, one of the videos. Sorry. Yeah, so when you get onto a stubborn area first, I'm going to Just a minute. Just a minute, please. Actually, I've lost uh, control of the mouse here. That's the problem here. So I need to see if I can find a way to. OK, let me just uh, go on with this. Let's uh, forget about those videos. Apologize for that because the mouse is not working. So uh, this is another uh, case to study, the coral scan. Uh, so coral scan, non-destructive testing. We need to know where is the location of the, the, the rust underneath the paint. So we have designed this system, the coral scan, uh, NDT, this inspection system for corrosion under insulation layer. So basically it uses capacitors to uh, uh, to to investigate what is underneath the surface and if there is a rust layer underneath it will it will show that so as a dark spot which you can see over here next one yes this this is our last slide general applications of the laser cleaning for removal of greasy and bacteria infected surfaces you can use uh, laser cleaning to to remove these uh, layers that are sticking sticky biofilms that are sticking to the bi barbecue plates in uh, in food industry and in case of bacteria you can also use uh, use them to uh, near IR lasers or mid IR lasers to remove the bacteria from these surfaces. And finally, we get to the end and we have some conclusions here. The conclusion, so the conclusions for the talk is basically laser cleaning is more environmentally friendly. It uh, reduces damage to substrate if you choose the right parameters great selectivity, more flexibility, doesn't require secondary medium, reduces health hazards to the operator, is less noisy. And compared to other methods such as sandblasting, dry icing, and chemical stripping, uh, is more economical. So we studied the different physics effects, pulse duration, fluence, repetition rate, 
Uh, these are all important parameters that need to be considered for different applications. And we show that use of accessories such as cobalt ROS, a coral scan, fume extractor nozzle will help the laser cleaning process. We compare the CO2 laser uh, operation with the near IR fiber laser. And we said that although CO2 laser wavelength is inherently safe for removing paint from a metal surface, uh, there is more flexibility in using near IR and you can avoid damaging the substrate if you control the parameters uh, carefully with the fiber laser. Uh, laser cleaning could be a very good replacement for sandblasting in shipping industry. Its selectivity and environmental friendliness are definitely big advantages over sand, sandblasting. And finally, uh, we showed in the case study robotic laser cleaning for F18 radioactive isotope uh, from different metal surfaces. The operation was very successful and this result was presented in a poster in Waste Management 2022 conference in Phoenix, Arizona. So with this, we come to the end of the webinar. Thank you for listening. And sorry for this uh, little technical problem at the end. And my mouse, yeah, it's actually come back now. For some reason, it was not working for a while. So uh, we'll send you all the videos. Now, that's not a problem at all. We send you the videos and you can watch them. The one that I couldn't send the link for. So here is my email again if in case you have any any questions and at this point i would like to ask the audience if they have any questions they can ask so let me see if somebody has written some questions here so there are a few questions costs and training safety info please alan is asking this question all right so as far as costs alan are you still there yes he's here okay so as far as the cost is concerned, normally a uh, 100 watt system, uh, you multiply the wattage by $1,000. So that will be the cost of the system. So normally 100 watt is 100,000, 200 watt, 200,000. Just roughly, rough estimate, 500 watt is 500,000. Training and safety, well, deal. Safety usually revolves around protection of the eye, so you don't need a heavy personal protection equipment, just like you do in case of uh, sandblasting or other other methods. Uh, and you can define certain areas uh, with some protection system. So we will we would have a laser training course for your your staff. We already have like some. Uh, laser clean for course it talks about interlocks implementing interlocks around the area where you're doing the the laser cleaning so we would provide all of that next question there was another question product comparison to overseas competitors uh, life expectancy yeah that one, I can't do that comparison for you. Sorry, product comparison to overseas because that is part of the marketing department. So I can't, I can't comment on that. Maybe we can, I'll ask, I'll ask our, our managers and see if I can give an answer for you. But as far as the life expectancy, I can show you some uh, brochures. 200 watt, 80,000 hours for a 200 watt system. And laser blast. This one also had yes, estimate the, lifetime expectancy yeah. 10 years. Excuse me, Rez. The, the product comparison uh, to overseas uh, competitors. Any other so questions? I think I want to answer all the questions. Anyone else has a question? Can you hear me, Rez? Rez. Okay. So if not, uh, thank you very much for listening Rez. to the webinar. And if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot me an email 
and please fill out the feedback form as well. And uh, I wish you a very good evening and stay safe. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Alan, can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. Okay, there's for some reason, uh, Rez was not hearing us. I, I don't know what's going on. For your question about the, the product comparisons to overseas uh, competitors. So there's a, there's a recently in the laser, uh, the laser market, there's a lot of competitors where, uh, where quality, quality is a big concern because we had, um, we had so many demonstrations with other competitors. Uh, we had so many demonstrations with, with other competitors where we witnessed uh, so many times that the other lasers are not working for several profiles like paint removal, rust removal, or it's damaging the surface or, or everything. At, at, at Light Scientific Pro, we make sure that always the quality is number one. Yes, we are a little bit uh, uh, more expensive than others, but we are the the most the most serious and, and client support, uh, after sales support and our machines, uh, especially the lasers were, were certified by, for example, the University of Dayton when, when they conducted the research. Uh, with the U.S. Air Force and uh, our our laser machine uh, in in competition with other brands uh, got certified for grounded uh, materials uh, for the U.S. Air Force and uh, the restoration of the Canadian Parliament building, which one of the biggest architecture building in um, in Canada, is being restored uh, for now for several years. They're, they've been using our laser to 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 be to be restored. So I hope I answered your question about the uh, compa comparisons because the market is uh, is getting flooded uh, bit by bit by uh, Chinese products or other products that uh, we know that users or the one that using it, they're facing a lot of problems. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Any other questions concerning uh, Cost, marketing stuff. I can I can help you with that. Yeah, no, that's um, that, that was good. Very informative. That's all the information I need for now. Thank you. You're welcome, Alan. I hope you enjoyed the webinar, and uh, we sent you all a survey and the supporting documents. You can watch the videos uh, when you feel like it, and you can see everything. If if you have any other questions, we are all available to answer your your questions. All right. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for attending. Okay. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.